fireside side chat on the vision for India. I have a dream. And today we are joined by, you know, none other than Dr. Murthanjay Atriya, I think the founder and pioneer of the Indian management profession, as we would, you know, really call it for the past five decades, he has been taking management to pretty much all the corners and sectors of India. The government of India has recognized Dr. Atreya uh, for his contribution with the Padma Bhushan back in 2014. Uh, you know, professionally honored as the Bhishma Pitama and the grand guru of Indian HRD, a very respected icon of the Indian costing profession. And I think, you know, today a national evangelist on four very major challenges before India in the 21st century. And I think these are such critical challenges that we have to overcome, you know, climate healing, coping with China, reduction of inequality, and sustaining dharma. I think if we can get these four things right, you know, nothing can prevent us from realizing the Swarnam Bharat of 2047. So very, very warm welcome to you, Dr. Atri, and thank you so much for agreeing to do this. You know, CII has championed uh, India at 75 as a as a very large multi-stakeholder ambition, vision, uh, and agenda for what India could be, you know, and this exercise started back at India at 60. We are at India at 75 today. The new India of 2022 conceptualized by the Honorable Prime Minister, the new government, you know, picked up a large part of the thinking of what CIA has offered. And what we're really hoping to achieve through this conversation today is really address the one key part of our management challenges as we move, you know, from our Amrut Mahotsav to a Swarnam Bharat. And I think this is something that if we can solve for India, uh, I think we can probably provide global leadership uh, on this count to the rest of the world. Large part of, you know, Indian talent is today leading large global corporations, especially when we see it in tech and many others. And I'm sure there's a deep understanding of how to really unlock that economic value, but at the same time, you know, keep the non-negotiables of India and a large part of the world in mind, I think, and you have talked about, you know, many of those pieces. But, you know, to kickstart this conversation, uh, and we're going to keep it a free-flowing chat, really would love to understand, you know, how, because if you look at those four areas you talk about, right, are, are, are all areas where we're talking of taking people along. Right. So it's not only really about inclusive development for India, but inclusive development of the world. And, you know, where do we really see the world moving, you know, over the next 25 years and what role can India, you know, play in that? So maybe to kickstart the discussion, would love to, you know, hear some of your thoughts around that. And then we'll move into other areas that you're so passionate about. Yeah, I think the next 25 years are critical for India. They're also critical for the world. The world will move in a direction, but India should also give it a push. It is one of the large economies, one of the large civilizations. And therefore, we are not only a passenger going along with where the world is going, we will be part of the architect in designing that route as well. That is the capability India has to develop and strengthen. Internally, this inclusive development has to include all religions, all classes, castes of people, regions of the country, genders, uh, and this uh, slogan of the Prime Minister, Sapka Vikas, Sapka, uh, Sapka Saat, and that, that five points there uh, has to be fully implemented. Also, I think uh, as a responsible uh, large power, uh, fourth in GDP now, second in population, part of the uh, Indus uh, uh, League, uh, as well as many other peace-loving uh, alliances like the U2I2 just recently formed, uh, we will make a contribution to this. Now, uh, sustainable development goal includes many parameters. Uh, we are, our GDP has been moving up. It stagnated for a long time till 1990. With the liberalization, it started moving. That again, it fell for the 10 years. Now, last eight years, we, were, we should have done even better, except for the... Uh, the, the uh, this uh, uh, crisis of the infections, uh, repeat infections, third wave, fourth wave coming up. Uh, but we are doing better than most of the countries on these as well. Now, GDP alone is not enough. We have to work on ESG. Uh, the uh, environmental goals, Prime Minister has made great commitments in Glasgow. 
uh, for 2030, as you know, four goals by 2030 and net zero by 2070. Uh, and uh, to this, we have to add social aspects, women, persons with disability, LTGB, and the governance values, uh, not only the shareholder, but the customer, all other stakeholders of the company have to be taken along. So uh, this is a very exciting period to be in India and to be young, uh, as Wordsworth said for the French Revolution, is very heaven. Uh, so we have high potential. Uh, our weakness has been not in planning, but in implementation. And we also scale up in a massive way and uh, exploit the advantages that are opening up with China slowing down, the uh, aging population, uh, our workforce. I know you have questions later on these issues. So uh, on the whole, I have always been throughout my life an optimist. I returned from Harvard in 1967. Uh, many of my relatives and friends discouraged me from doing so. They were very pessimistic about the future of India. I believe that the country with this history, this population, these resources has to do well. It is our job to stay here and make it happen rather than give up hope. And I think we have come a long way in these last 50 years and created a base from which we can now launch this next assault towards Swarnimbara 2047. No, I think, I think you mentioning about you coming back you know, and, and serving India from here is, is, is a very inspiring thought, I think, to many. Uh, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, Professor C.K. Prahlad was one of the, you know, professors who was, of course, at Michigan and, you know, came back and really talked about India at 75 when India had turned 60 and spent a lot of time in India, you know, working with a lot of the stakeholders to, to evangelize that vision. You know, but being here on the ground and making the changes happen, inspiring so many people to, to do so much more is indeed, uh, you know, very, very important. And, and I think a big role and contribution that you have made. But, you know, you talked about governance, uh, you know, as you were, you know, discussing some of the things from a corporate standpoint and others. But what, what do you really think, you know, are the governance challenges that, you know, we need to address as a country? especially as we are transitioning to a golden age, right? When we're talking of Swarnam Bharat and your focus on Dharma, really, how do you, how do you see that happening, right? How much of it will come, you know, will be self done? What should the environment be like? What's your vision as you look forward on governance? Right. I think governance and management both have to improve. Governance is the overall direction of the institution, its image, its reputation. Uh, management is the nitty gritty of actually formulating the strategic plans, budgets, projects, executing them on time. And we have to now catch up on the German, Korean, Japanese, Chinese standards of implementation. That is where we've been falling down in the past. So uh, uh, my topic of management challenges, let me first take up at the government level. I think there is some improvement and there is need for much more and, and the outlook is positive, national management, state level management. At least eight states have now taken the ownership and responsibility for their own development and stop blaming the center or other external forces. This has to happen in the rest of the country. A pride in every state. Our average state has a population of about 40, 50 million, as large as many European countries. Uh, we also have to improve urban level management there are some large urban concentrations who have a massive population and more urbanization will take place in the next 20, 30 years. We have to improve state level as well as uh, district and panchayat level administration. So there are these 122 districts that have been picked up, backward districts, and district leadership can make a change. For example, if you take uh, uh, the uh, example of Tenkashi, Vembu, say they're going there, Second and third level cities, rural areas are now attracting industry and investment. And finally, corporate management. And I would appeal to every Indian professional, every Indian citizen on better self-management. I think it is that individual entity, if every one of them become more conscious of their potential strengths and weaknesses and find their own life missions, careers, then they will either join existing organizations or 
be part of this uh, startup revolution that we are seeing in the country. We will have more unicorns coming up. I, I think the uh, immense potential. So management skills have to be infused at every level. You have talked about skilling. Uh, skill is one part. I'd like to add three other variables. Uh, knowledge, uh, which is continuous learning, lifelong learning, updating, uh, skill, of course, on how to do it, but values and attitudes. And uh, uh, these have to be Loka uh, Sangraha, committed to the country, community welfare. Uh, also, uh, the uh, uh, habits of perform, regular habits. I think we have to uh, institutionalize this into the individual's daily routine. This is where I think the advanced countries, the new industry, Asian tigers have scored over us. We have patchy high performance, not sustained, predictable, routine, day after day, month after month, a reliable grinding performance. Those companies in India who have done that have done very well. So cash, K-A-S-H, knowledge, attitude, skills, and habits. These four dimensions have to be developed in every minister, every civil servant, every chief secretary of a state, every district uh, uh, officer, IAS officer, and uh, heads of panchayats. I think some amount of training, uh, uh, using social funds better, delivery systems, use of technology, we, uh, these should help us in, in the long run to improve the management process and delivery. I think the cash concept is very good. You know, I, it brings out a very easy way to remember. But, you know, Dr. Atreya, <clears throat> habits are, are, are hard, right? I mean, it, it, it takes a grind to, to make it, you know, and they say, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get, but it's also hard to give up, right? So somewhere, maybe we have habits that are not really, you know, aligned with, you know, a lot of the things that, that you said. So how does one really change that habit, right? I mean, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, easier, yeah. it's easier said than done. I mean, yeah, in five yeah. decades, you've seen so much. Yeah. How, how does one really change that? Any thoughts? I, I, let me share, if I may be allowed, a personal autobiographical note here. For the last 40 years, Mr. Navani, I've been sleeping at 10 p.m., waking up at 5 a.m., Sundays, holidays included. That's because I have a beautiful routine for the day. I love that routine. It includes exercise thrice a day, a reasonable diet, a lot of work, some socialization, reading, so not a dull moment. So people have to first fix the parameters of their day, not wake up at different times and go to sleep at different times. So one is fix those beginning and ending coordinates. Then have a continuous pipeline of things to do. So I talk about a life vision, a professional mission in one's life, a five-year broad overview, an annual plan, and now with cell phone, diaries, reminders, these have become much easier. So uh, there are two kinds of dharma required for good habits to come. Leaders in organizations must follow Sreshta dharma. The Sreshta does two things. Uh, he, his behavior is a model. He sets the standards. Praman and Acharan, two things they have to do. And every employee has to follow Praja dharma, which is to put the organization above the self, and uh, work to the best of one's capacity and move from being a karmachari who is working for the money at the end of the month to a karma yogi who will work anyway with the confidence that the rewards will come, both the increments, promotions, bonuses, where will they go? So that kind of confidence in leadership and the organization so that the individual's total energy goes into work. So we have to create a leadership condition as well as the motivation and the right kind of reward system, which gives a signal that those who have good habits, consistent habits, and keep delivering will be recognized, will be noted, will not be ignored. The uh, uh, manipulators, the crybabies will not get the rewards, but the deserving ones. And this has happened recently in the Padma Awards, for example. Government has improved its search process and identified people. For the first time, we have seen barefoot people coming and receiving the award from the president in Rashtrapati Bhavan unimaginable in the last 40 or years. We have to create those conditions of true merit recognition. So the top management is to establish the dharma and the rest of the organization has to follow that dharma. I think a meritocratic society, you know, guided with enough 
incentive, uh, yeah. you know, for the meritorious, you know, but also I think, you know, somewhere um, when, you know, if you look at the civil service, we look at many things while you may not get recognition or promotion or many of the things for doing something good, you know, we do not even have a very large penal uh, kind of a system, you know, when things are not getting done, right? I mean, I think sometimes it's, uh, you know, holding both together. <laughs> how how does that, how does a society really work, you know, uh, with with that, you know, it, uh, while, while you, you're absolutely right, how, does one really look at taking people along irrespective? You know, of course, I know it will depend at different levels, but how, how do you view that, right? I think really... the performance culture I've been watching in public sector, as well as in government, has been improving over the years. Just to give a micro example, the Delhi Golf Club is now closed. You cannot go there, uh, come sign up and then go off for the day. So you have to be around. Uh, so when the ministers themselves work hard, when the secretary works hard, down the line, there is an, this has to come into every state government. It has come in some places. That is why those states are doing better on the social indicators. Every annual report puts them in the top five, six. So I think th this has to uh, continue. Uh, and the civil service also, there is now a performance system, uh, which, which is not punishment by way of dismissal. Uh, in some cases, it has happened. Railways recently dismissed a whole lot of officers for poor performance. But postings, uh, the kind of jobs that are given to them, the uh, richer jobs, more uh, satisfying, are given to the better performers. So the compensation is not only in terms of salary and perks. In any case, the, servant, the civil servant pensions are very good now, inflation related, and it goes on for the rest of their life, 80 plus. Uh, the, the thing to do is to move, move more and more things out of government into the autonomous sector, independent institutions, and the competitive regulated market. I think we've made great progress in the insolvency uh, resolution area, for example. Uh, the uh, Competition Commission is now promoting uh, customer interest rather than uh, blindly opposing all mergers and acquisitions. Uh, it, it is taking a broader view now. Uh, every institution is now uh, that old adversarial attitude, which I saw when I returned from Harvard, that government and business are adversaries has given way to partnership, cooperation. Uh, Government will never become as good as the industry. It has not become in any country. In the US, there is a lot of hostility towards the bureaucracy. Uh, and uh, many, uh, France is one exception where they're performing well. Uh, but generally, I think uh, it is uh, uh, creating independent organizations, more competition, uh, uh, customer interest, and maybe some sabbaticals move between government and industry, uh, co-opting senior industry people into committees, commissions. I think that, that's on now. Uh, a lot of consultation is going on. For example, in restructuring the finance and banking industry, uh, they have played a good role. The uh, uh, IT industry, we are on the verge of 5G. We will be among the world's early ones to go into 5G. It will have enormous potential for transforming business, rural communication, the uh, international connectivity, education, health delivery, uh, awesome potential. No, I think, I think trusted collaboration between government, industry, business is so key, right? For us to be able to unlock the true value of what we can do together, you know, as a country. And, you know, I'm now going to make you look a little further ahead, you know, and, and you're looking at businesses today, right? You've seen businesses when you came back, you said from Howard and, and, you know, how, business has progressed in India. But if you were to put, you know, a little futuristic view, right? How, how do you see the businesses of India 2047 being different, particularly from businesses of today? Yeah, okay, they'll be very different, there's no question. It is difficult to look that far ahead, but for example, they will be uh, highly digitalized. They will be distributed organizations, not concentrated just in their head on regional offices, but the uh, communication enables us uh, to work from anywhere now. So they will be highly decentralized, but networked through communication, video and similar facilities. They will be massive. I think the one thing we have failed to do so far 
even where we have been good and we have demonstrated our capacity, we have not scaled up. So a few are in India are building those kinds of organizations. That's um, Mukesh Ambani, Gautam Adani, the Tata Group. They are thinking massive sizes. So I think the Indian businesses will be big. They will be like what China businesses have been for some time, uh, leveraging Indian human resources, other talent, management talent, uh, to have a global organization. Uh, another uh, insight, uh, I hope it will happen fully by 2047. For these large corporations, Indian co companies, India will be only one country market. Their natural way of thinking will be the world as the market. Not India and out of India exports slowly, slowly, incrementally building up. But companies which at the from the very start may have operations in India, headquarters in India, but will look at the world as our market and go wherever. So the investments will be proportionate to those markets in US, Europe, Japan, Africa, Latin America. So the world they will be world corporations, number one. They will use the latest technology at that time, which is difficult now to visualize AI, machine learning, uh, various kinds of methodologies. Now, robots, these would have gone far. In fact, there are both uh, uh, pessimistic and optimistic, utopian and dystopian forecasts about what this independent uh, bots will do amongst themselves and to human beings. But I think at, uh, at the end of the day, human beings will have good regulatory procedures. We will discover, we will gradually refine uh, and continue to master technology for our needs rather than go other way around. So we can expect to see in India a network of large uh, uh, corporations split all across the country, less need for travel, commuting, much better communication uh, and uh, looking at the world market. Also, I think export will be a big part, leveraging Indian manpower. Although they may be headquartered in India, investments in India, uh, they will be looking at the world market and India will have some share in it. Ideally, it should be not more than 14%, which is our share of the population. Yeah, I think, I think uh, pretty uh, interesting to see large global corporations coming out from India. You know, but as we think about that, would we have a globally employable workforce? You know, and you also talked of bots, you know, when man and machine start to work together, you know, the challenges around that ethics, you know, and, 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 and how do we really, you know, prepare for that, for that new world, right? Is there a new way for us to educate, you know, in India? Or is there, you know, a different way of how India will need to prepare for such, such a environment any any thoughts around uh, yeah I, I, I think in this in the past we have failed we have not made enough investment as a country on health and education the two most important things so we have a, an underclass of population which is not even literate anguta chap uh, very moderately new education policy gives us a roadmap for improving education all over from elementary middle to college level and I think we should give them those basic education of language, uh, quantitative methods, and social uh, awareness. On top of that, vocationalization of education is part of the new education policy. From the very early stage, streaming people into the kinds of industries, jobs where they have natural aptitude and want to work in those places. So there is no, uh, 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 there will be no finished products from the education system. They will be ready for some time obsolete in three to five years, continuous education, continuous learning, short-term courses, online courses, self-learning, uh, modules, uh, various kinds of uh, 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 computer-based, uh, 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 tailor-made online learning opportunities. And I think these are ways in which we have to, every company has to develop its people. Now, to the extent some of them uh, are not uh, capable of coming up uh, or jobs are for questions of safety uh, uh, and quality, accident possibility, they, we may uh, automate and mechanize. Uh, our population is also beginning to slow down, growth is slowing down, there is aging. So I think this may not be as big a problem as we thought five, 10 years ago, 
uh, the aging process will take care of itself to some extent. We must make sure that every child born today has the opportunity for world-class education skilling in her, his lifetime. And that can still be done. I, I, think, I think the need for a better livelihood for you know, people of this gen, next generation, you know, will continue to be a, a common thread, I think, that will you know, unite you know, uh, people in India and pretty much around the world. And I think, therefore, being able to create you know, the right skills and the future skills, right, as you rightly said, will be so different from what you know, we have been building you know, so far. But that also takes me to a, a, to a new point, right? I mean, you know, uh, future global leadership, new skills uh, is going to require India to innovate you know, uh, really rapidly, really well, you know, especially when we talk of a blueprint for an Amrit Kal, you mm -hmm. know, the next 25 years are so critical. You know, and Dr. Atriya, when we talk of 25 years, we really talk about it as a marathon with, you know, five-year sprints, you know, because we got to continue to take stock, continue to see whether world is changing, actually help lead the change in many aspects, you know, as we, as we move forward. So, you know, this, you, you talked of habits and we talked about some of these things, but this culture of an innovation or, you know, you talked of 5G and technology led, you know, uh, kind of change for both India and the world. You know, how, how do we really, again, create that? What, what are your thoughts? You know, when do you see big change in that space happening and, and, and how? Okay. Now, uh, one of the things that is going to happen in the next five years is, uh, scale. Uh, many, many industries and companies will see scaling up, both by internal investment as well as by merger and acquisition. It is already happening in the in energy industry, uh, the uh, two-wheeler electric industry, cars. So uh, we will create the, these uh, companies. Beyond that, I think uh, as they scale up, companies will be able to allocate more funds for R&D. So internal corporate R&D which is picked up in some industries like our, uh, pharmaceuticals, for example, our success in the Serum Institute, uh, the vaccine. Similarly, uh, in cancer medicine, antibiotics, we've been uh, among the better ones in the world. Uh, so with scale will come R&D. Now, academic institutes in India are also growing, modernizing, facing competition. Foreign universities can op open campuses here. Our management graduates are found the world market, the campuses of IAMs, ISP. People are coming from all over the world to recruit talent from here. Uh, so we will retain some of that talent. So academia, industry, cooperation, R&D. This will become more of a reality compared to the past uh, because both are uh, scaling up. Third is government becoming more professional, uh, faster. So government, industry, academia, three-way cooperation. That is the way things have moved in most of the countries in the early stages. Uh, and I think all three have to show the maturity, mutual tolerance, the relationship skills to together work for India Incorporated on, on the world stage, uh, to put it on the map. So for the workers, in addition to the skills which I mentioned, there are three mantras that I uh, would like to suggest, I keep repeating, productivity, world-class productivity, match the best productivity of Germany, Japan, Korea, the countries that I mentioned, quality, uh, highest quality, and discipline uh, in uh, the workspace in life. Uh, these three uh, together. So uh, the R&D part will improve. And also returning Indians who have built businesses abroad, investing back home, or their talent coming back to India, leveraging that uh, talent. I think for them, the Indian domestic market has become some kind of a minimum uh, attractive size. And from that, if we can also export, that'll give a huge global uh, scale. So I think our turn now to step up expenditure on R&D uh, and profitability of Indian companies is relatively better. So one or two percentage of that profit can be allocated to R&D now. Political conditions are stable. We can expect them to be stable for the next 10 years, at least as of now. Uh, so I think it is now time for large-scale investment on R&D and CapEx by big companies in India. Uh, I think this is a transition now. China 
the Communist Party led it. In Japan, the uh, bureaucracy led it. In India, the corporates have to lead it. Corporates have more of the knowledge, more of the know-how, expertise. Uh, I think they have to provide servant leadership, unobtrusive from behind, but provide the leadership. The, uh, the politician and the minister and the bureaucrat should appear to be up front, but the real power, intellectual and professional power is coming from captains of industry. I think organizations like CII can play a major role in that process. Unobtrusive oh, I, country leadership. No, I, I think that's a very, very strong point you bring out in, in how a country like India will, you know, achieve its position of global leadership differently from the way maybe a Japan or China has done it in the past. And, 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 and I think the, the corporate sector's investments in R&D innovation are all going to drive price performance, you know, in one direction, right? Because the Indian consumer is... Is, 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 is a difficult consumer to please in any case. You know, of course, we have large numbers. We have, you know, low disposable income. So, you know, innovation or frugal innovation becomes, you know, pretty much an essential way to both scale and grow. So I think if we are able to build the innovation and building blocks, you know, on that and bring industry, academia and government together, I think this, this, this trio or the teen murti like we always have, you know, the Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva of India could right. probably really change, yeah, yeah. you know, sure. the, the future in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a very, very strong way. But, you know, the drivers, Dr. Atriya, are going to be the young people, right? Yes. yes. You know, it is, it is like what you said, you know, it is, it is a time when, you know, the world is recognizing the power of Indian youth and its ability and capability. So on the one side, you're saying there's a reverse brain drain, people will come back you know, and bring, but I, I see a lot of good, sharp, smart people, you know, leaving India and being absorbed by global corporations, you know, being absorbed in different parts of the world, right? What, what's your message to the young people, right? How can they stay back, contribute uh, to national development? How do they prioritize India and their contribution from India, you know, for the world as, as we move, up, you know, forward? You've had rich experience and you've seen all types of situations in so many decades, right. you know, something. I, 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 ad I, 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 I address a number of, as you might imagine, university audiences, students, alumni, sure. all over India. And there are four mantras that I submit to them for their consideration. First is that uh, have a life vision for a hundred year life. Their generation, we, I myself 80 plus, I think they, they will all live hundred plus. Uh, so they can confidently plan on a long life and they must have a vision for this life. What do I mean by that? Uh, in your old age, if you look back and you regret, oh my God, what have I done with my life? It is a fantastic opportunity if you plan early enough. So they must have a life vision of which India must be an important part. In between, they can go here and there, ex ex get experience and so on. But India must be the core of their life vision. Second, they should have a professional mission in that life. Not just a job, salary, promotions, a titles, and so on. But what is my contribution? What will I be recognized for? What will stay behind my flesh and blood have left? So a sense of mission in that profession, whether it is marketing, accounting, management, medicine, uh, different services, whatever they take up, uh, it must be done with a missionary sense rather than a, a employment uh, for survival. It is not livelihood, but it is a contribution mission, number two. Number three, by all means, go abroad, study. There are great opportunities there, but make your Janma Bhumi your Karma Bhumi, the bulk of your work, your life. So you can spend three years, five years, even seven, but the longer you stay, there is a mathematical formula with every passing year, the probability of return to India declines exponentially. So I think this, uh, get married to the right girl, an Indian girl preferably, come back and live here and make India like those countries which you like so much. Who will do it if you all uh, pack up and go? So study, work abroad, return, make the Janma Bhumi or Karma Bhumi. Uh, it, this has been my life, my message. And the fourth point I'd like to leave with them is that help India manage these four challenges, which I mentioned and you recollected at the very beginning. Climate change, China, inequality, and dharma values. 
because the world is having a dangerous situation of great power conflict, cold war, rivalry once more, uh, divided groups. Uh, after Gorbachev brought perestroika in the Soviet Union, I made speeches with great optimism that we will now get the peace dividend. The era of conflicts is over. The world will experience peace and expenditure on arms will now go back into R&D, education and health. Uh, it, that was happening, but alas, it has now got a big jolt. So it is the youth of India uh, who have to preserve our climate. Independent of what funds we receive, what the Western countries do, it is in our own enlightened self-interest. Our coastal areas are already under threat. We have climate refugees within the country. Uh, there is a, uh, There are changes in the weather patterns right now, the heat of northern India. So they have to save this country, future generations, their own children and grandchildren from the ravages of climate, number one. So they are needed here. Number two, China next door. China sees India as the only country in the world which can stop their hegemony with a kind of population and skills. So they have to stay here. Uh, we don't have a single dictatorship, but I think in the long run, I have no doubt, democracy is a better form of government, more resilient. Uh, and uh, then I think the inequality index is going up and up, the Gini coefficient, uh, uh, and that will create left-wing movements, uh, Dalit movements, various kinds of fringe movements. So we have to include everyone and reduce this inequality. And finally, uh, Dharma will always be challenged by the uh, corrupt, the, the wicked, and we have to keep re-establishing Dharma. So I think they, they will have a most interesting life. This kind of life and job satisfaction is not available anywhere in the world. In my view, I know India is the most exciting country to live in and work in. No, I think, I think there's never been a better time to be an Indian and to be in India and actually help shape you know, the future of the world through a economic development of a country of 1.4 billion people. Never happened in the history of mankind. Right, 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 and right. I think the the ability to be able to contribute to that, I think, is 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 so exciting, you know, by itself, and so and so so eloquently put by you, Dr. Etria, and I'm sure this will, you know, be an inspiration for many to 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 understand how they can play a more meaningful role as we move towards, uh, you know, Swarnam Bharat of 2047. You know, there are some questions that are, you know, coming up. Uh, one of them uh, for you is that India has moved directly from an agrarian uh, to a services economy, you know, uh, as a society, there is still very little manufacturing in high and low skill industries. How do you think that can be addressed? Okay, uh, before I take that, I'd like to be a very important question. Uh, you you have a question about my dream for India. You are yes, of course, I'm going to end with you, that. You will take that. We are, we are not running out of time. You will have time for it. Okay, good. So yes. let me take this question. I think this was an error. The questioner is quite right that uh, because of uh, Nehru's fascination with the Soviet Union and his belief in heavy industry, capital goods, we put a lot of money into those. I think there was an alternative economic model for India, which was to use the labor endowment of the country and um, focus on industries like textiles and so on and make it for the market as well as for export market and gradually build the scale, which would then justify the capital expenditure and also follow the German model of the government uh, bank, which give large funds as loans to industry uh, and repayable. So the, industry, the capital investment takes place, but under private management rather than uh, state management. So I think for 30, 40 years, we made that error. Uh, I have worked with many public enterprises, man to man, every public executive is dedicated, competent, but the system is highly frustrating. Therefore, the potential returns have not come. We have realized that. And since about 1980, there is a switch in thinking. Indira Gandhi, VP Singh, Rajiv, not only the liberalization 1991, there is an awareness even from the Janta Dal government in 1977. We have changed that old statist model towards a more mixed economy and now more towards a market model. So that was an error. We have paid for it, but we must learn from it. There is no escape. We must build a huge manufacturing industry. Service alone cannot employ the people that we have. So we must put a heavy stress on manufacturing. Yeah, I think I think very well addressed. And and you're right, you know, I our time has, has started to run, but you know, the 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 key part of this conversation cannot end without your dream for India. 
right i think i think you know you have yours there's a richness of experience expertise wisdom you know and inspiration right for the for the next generation and 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 how what is your dream you know for india if you were to to summarize uh, that for for everyone here right i know it is being recorded maybe vaishali may also be keeping handwritten notes so let me state this dream slowly i have a dream for india to be a role model in governance and global cooperation a big force for peace on earth and space by 2047 the each word has a meaning has a significance that a role model in governance because there is now a challenge to democracy not as a good form of governance autocracy is being strongly promoted by some powers which is not correct uh, and we are there not for hegemony global conflict but we are there for global cooperation it will facilitate cooperation not only with india but amongst other countries and peace is threatened now not only on earth but space as well military technology is going into space uh, some countries are planning to occupy parts of the moon and others for mining the resources uh, the the world agreement that space will not be contested it will be uh, commonly owned by humanity is being now broken so i think india should stay firm be moral and be a moral force for the world uh, for that it has to be a strong economy to be credible uh, it should not be like the way stalin said pope is a general without army uh, we have to have power uh, soft and hard power but to have the right values this is my dream for 2047 so economic strength technological vitality which will give us moral leadership and yes. the ability to shape and direct the future of the world i think such a powerful you know conversation uh, dr atreya i mean it's been 45 minutes but you know we can go on and on and uh, you know really being able to to capture the vastness of your thinking and mind in 45 minutes is actually doing injustice to this so i am going to you know look, keep coming back to you you know as we continue to shape this agenda you know you know different pieces you know to kind of see how we can delve deeper you know into really enabling us to put together you know in a very collaborative trusted manner you know different aspects of of what we really need to achieve uh, together as a country but but again thank you so much for being here with us for sharing so many of your wonderful thoughts and 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 i must say that you know we're going to take a large part of this thinking into a vision document for india at 100 that bcg and cii and are putting together and of course as i said you know this is just the beginning of a 25 you know a year amrit kal journey taking us from amrit mahotsav to swarnam bharat so again thank you thank you so much for your time and your thoughts today my compliments you to the foundation to cii for this excellent initiative i wish it all success and in uh, you also steered this conversation very well it was very stimulating to hear and answer your questions thank you thank you it was your answers that gave us the power to do so so thank you take care all the best bye bye